Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again and thank you for joining us. This is the podcast known as Space Nuts. My name's Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me as always is astronomer Fred Watson. G'day, Fred. G'day, Andrew. How are you going? I'm well. How are you, sir? I'm all right, thanks. That's good to hear. Um, it's better than being half left. Now, yes, it is. <laughs> Indeed, that's right, which is the normal situation. <laughs> uh, today we're going to talk about uh, a couple of things involving the moon. First of all, China's lunar exploration plans and, and their goals, which are very exciting, and uh, the plans of one Elon Musk, who seems to be in the news every other day. Uh, There's also something uh, in the news that we've talked about before, and that is trying to figure out ways of uh, catching space junk. And uh, there's there's a new chapter in that little uh, venture. And a a question or a couple of questions have come to us about gravitational waves. People are very intrigued by them, Fred. Uh, And the um, the other half of the question involves mass extinction events. So uh, that um, may well have some sort of connection with astronomy or may not. We will uh, we'll get to that a little later. But first of all, Fred, uh, it's been nearly 50 years since we uh, jumped on the moon and left all our garbage there. Uh, now, there are pl- now there are plans. Oh, and by the way, I'm looking very much forward to the, uh, the new movie First Man which is about Neil Armstrong. It's coming out very soon. Uh, China's lunar exploration plans, they want to get to the the far side of the moon. That's right, for the first time. Uh, So all the lunar exploration that has been done uh, so far, at least on the surface, either robotically or by humans walking around on the moon, it's all been done uh, on the near side of the moon. And the reason for that is very simple. That's the best place to put a spacecraft if you want to communicate with Earth. Mm. We do know a lot about the far side because, of course, orbiting spacecraft are able to image the the far side. And I mean, spacecraft that orbit the moon and perhaps the most prominent at the moment is uh, NASA's uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has done a fantastic job of imaging the moon's surface, including all the Apollo uh, landing sites. So we've seen what's left there, the stuff you were talking about being left behind. But the idea of going to the far side of the moon is an audacious, um, an, uh, an audacious one, which uh, has been proposed by the Chinese as part of their lengthy sequence of lunar exploration. Uh, the last uh, spacecraft that hit the headlines was their Chang'e 3 lander, which took with it a little rover. Uh, called Yutu or Jade Rabbit, uh, that uh, landed in December 2013. And um, the, 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 the rover actually operated for quite a long time. It had, um, if I remember rightly, it had an ultraviolet telescope on board, but it didn't rove. Um, I, some, something with the mechanism uh, broke down very quickly, so it wound up staying in the same spot. Yeah, but it you, you, know did... what, you know why? Why is that, Andrew? Why? <laughs> Tell me why. Come on. I'll buy this one. Come on. It's, it's pretty <laughs> obvious. Uh, made in China. Uh, well, I thought I just thought you were going to do something clever with the <laughs> jade rabbit there. <laughs> Never mind. No. <laughs> you leave that one alone. Okay. Mm. So um, the, 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 the mission, Chang'e 3, was um, partially and, in fact, probably mostly successful, apart from the, the rover itself. However, um, the program that the Chinese have, which culminates, of course, in in human uh, flights to the moon, uh, probably in the maybe in the late 2020s, um, but the, their program uh, now extends to Chang'e 4, and that mission is scheduled to launch in December. And as you said, uh, it's going to the far side of the moon. So the first problem is how do you communicate? with a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. The moon is entirely opaque to radio waves, so you're not going to beam anything through it. A massive Uh, antenna or maybe a satellite. 
It's yes, you you've you've got it right. It's a satellite, and it's a clever satellite too, and it's already there, which is pretty uh, amazing, uh, because they launched this uh, spacecraft, which is called. Uh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this. Uh, Kikyo, I think it translates as Magpie Bridge, which I like very much. Oh, that's nice. The Magpie Bridge is a communication satellite lo- launched back in May, as I said. Um, and apparently, it, it is uh, it, it is from a Chinese folk tale, um, and it, it comes about because of uh, separated lovers in the Milky Way. And the magpies of the world in the folktale form a bridge to reunite them. How about that? That's lovely, yes. It's very poetic. Yeah, it's very nice. Let me tell Uh, you, the magpies around here are not doing that at the moment. (laughs) No, well, that's right. You know they only swoop you if they don't like you, don't you? (laughs) Yeah, it's funny because uh, they do have have selective targeting because um, I play in the same group of golfers every weekend and they only ever go for one guy and it's not me it's it's poor old darren he, he gets swooped time and time again usually on the same hole by the same bird every saturday for a, yeah, for a couple of months it, it is remarkable there's, mm. a, there's a real study to be done in that how they how they know who you are because they have their favorites and you're clearly one of them if you don't get swooped yes anyway that, that is slightly off the topic um, what is really interesting about the Magpie Bridge communication satellite is where it's placed, because it is in orbit, but not in orbit about the moon. It's in orbit around a gra- uh, an, an imaginary point called the second Lagrange point. Yes. Um, all right. What what's that? Well, it's a it's a point. It's about sixty thousand kilometres. Behind the uh, beyond the far side of the moon. In other words, imagine the Earth, the moon, and this point in a straight line. Sixty thousand kilometres uh, beyond the moon is this stable point, and it, it's where the the gravity of the Earth, the gravity of the moon, and the effect of the centrifugal uh, rotation of the moon around the Earth, where they all balance out, and you get a sort of neutral point in gravity. Um, it, the, the, there is one on this side of the moon as well, what's called the L1 point, the first Lagrange point, uh, and there are actually four others as well. Uh, but the first one is the easiest one to understand because it's where the gravity of the Earth and the gravity of the moon exactly balance out, oh. hmm. and we, we can all get that. It's a little bit less um, uh, intuitive when you go to the other side of the moon and you find another one of these balance points. Uh, that's the L2 point. And this is the point in which, around which Magpie Bridge is in orbit. So you can imagine uh, a spacecraft orbiting around, effectively it's a a thing called a gravitational well. It's where gravity is low. And that um, mimics basically a gravitating body so that the Magpie Bridge spacecraft can orbit around it. It orbits around it in such a way that we can see it uh, from Earth um, on the, you know, beyond the moon. And so that means that the problem is solved. You beam your radio signals from Earth to Magpie Bridge and it beams them back to the far side of the moon. It's extraordinary stuff. Uh, just uh, wrapping this up, the uh, perhaps the most interesting thing about this, uh, this mission is that we expect we might find um, the uh, so some of the perhaps more exotic minerals that we believe exist on the moon. There is a, a region on the moon's far side. It's probably uh, the biggest impact basin on the moon, a very ancient one because it's, it, it itself is covered in craters. It's not like the impact basins on the near side, which are full of um, what used to be molten uh, basalt. This one's a big dent in the moon's uh, surface near its south pole. It's called the Aitken South Pole Basin. uh, And that is probably where the rover will will land, the new Chinese spacecraft. uh, And maybe, just maybe, we'll find all kinds of interesting stuff there because this is an area that um, very early on in the moon's history had a major clout from something pretty big. Mm. And and, uh, and, and we haven't been there in in person. And there's this... Uh, only sort of uh, orbiting observations that that we can really go on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a, a bit more of a mystery than than the the other side, uh, which is flatter too, I believe. That that's right. Um, I have a quote from um, from one of the um, uh, space engineers at the University of Sydney, Warwick Holmes, who I, I, I do know. Uh, he says 
talking of that region of the moon's surface, there are indications from orbiting spacecraft that there's iron, thorium, titanium, and other exotic minerals in this basin, which exist nowhere else on the moon. So it is an interesting place to go mm. uh, geologically, uh, as well as just the challenge of of you know putting a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. Yes, fascinating. All right. Well, we'll probably have more to report on that when uh, when the mission gets underway and they uh, they start sending back telemetry. I just love that word. Telemetry. It's a great word, isn't yeah. it? I, meanwhile, I, meanwhile, meanwhile, um, <laughs> we, we are still talking about the moon and yeah. the plans of one Elon Musk. That's right, who's now uh, talking about using a rocket that doesn't yet exist, but is certainly uh, on the stocks for, for the SpaceX company. It's called the BFR, the Big Falcon Rocket. Uh, and the or, Big Falcon, or, or something similar. Something similar, yes, is... Uh, it is one that will, you know, it's got a much bigger load capacity than their Falcon Heavy, which is the current biggest of their spacecraft. Uh, uh, what uh, Elon is proposing to do is send um, a paying customer around the far side of the moon and, and to come back, um, uh, basically on on one uh, trip on the big falcon rocket uh, the the person who's paying is a japanese billionaire and once again i'm probably mispronouncing his name i think it's yusaku uh, maitsawa or Ma maitsawa uh, he will pay uh, a fare to uh, to elon musk and spacex to take a trip on board the BFR, which will take him round the moon, in, probably in much the same way as Apollo 8 went round the moon in mm -hmm. 1968. Uh, but this is a much bigger spacecraft, and so this billionaire is proposing to take uh, half a dozen of his friends along as well. Uh, so that'll be quite an interesting trip. Gee, how do you become his friend? Oh, well, well, you'd probably just write to him. And uh, uh, He's talking about artists, I think. Um, he's uh, This gentleman is actually a... Um, uh, he owns a company that uh, retails clothing. Uh, it's called Zozo. Uh, so he founded the clothes retailer Zozo. Yeah. Uh, he's been a lifelong space fan. Uh, he's in his 40s, uh, and he probably has enough money to pay Elon to do the deal. So that is something to look out for, not, though, until 2023, because the spacecraft doesn't exist yet. Yes, and as we've seen with all these space tourist plans, they're probably... Getting a bit premature with the five-year plan. Maybe so. That's mm. possibly true. Yeah. Anyway, we'll watch with interest. And if you've got money to burn, hey, burn it. <laughs> Just burn it um, and, and enjoy the trip. Uh, yeah, it would be exciting to get up close and personal with the moon, I reckon. I think it'd be just amazing. Anyway, Indeed. we will watch that one with interest as well. You're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years, and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons, and there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked and a couple of years down the track honestly can't complain their interface is very easy to use their their service is second to none uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do and they were brilliant so you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all it's all about privacy uh, do you really want big tech companies governments and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity. Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space 
for three months free with a one-year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now, back to the show. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. Now, Fred, we're going to talk about space junk. We've talked about space junk before and the fact that there's so much of it and it has caused problems in the past. Uh, I remember us talking about them having to move the International Space Station to avoid a uh, direct hit. Uh, there have been issues with flecks of paint causing problems with the space shuttle and everyone agrees, uh, the international space community, that something has to be done. And now they're trying to figure out ways of removing debris from space, uh, everything from harpoons to nets. Uh, so it's back in the news again. What's happened? Uh, this experiment that um, you and I have spoken about before, it's a satellite uh, built by uh, the University of Surrey and various associates uh, designed to test some different technologies for getting rid of space junk. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem, as you've said. There's, um, I think it's about 22,000 bits of space debris that are tracked, and that's down to a size of something like four inches or 100 millimeters. But then below that, there are probably millions of bits mm. of stuff. And one estimate uh, that I read recently is that there's about 7,500 tons of space junk up there, which is probably about right when you think of all the launches that have been made and the fact that there's probably some big rocket bodies up there and things of that sort all tumbling around in space. Uh, it's a, a problem because if you get two bits of space junk colliding, then you suddenly have this, you know, this um, like a knock on effect. Uh, because that creates much more debris, which can then collide with other things. And before you know where you are, space is actually, um, you know, inaccessible. And yeah. that's that's the the doomsday scenario as far as spacecraft is concerned, uh, space travel is concerned. Um, so uh, the this is a, a first step uh, in trying out technologies that might help us to to deal with the space junk problem. And what the University of Surrey has done is sent a, a spacecraft up. It's, I think it's about the size of a fridge. It's quite heavy. I remember them, um, you know, the, when, we, when we talked about it being uh, ferried up to the International Space Station, we realized that it was quite a massive object. I think it's you know, getting, getting three quarters of a ton or something like that. If I remember rightly, I might be misremembering, but uh, that's what comes to mind. Um, so this uh, spacecraft, has the wonderful name of Remove Debris, um, <laughs> which we've, we've sort of, pre we've lauded before because it's a great name. It tells it like it is, Remove yeah. Debris. Um, and Remove Debris, all one word, of course. It's a bit, bit classy like that. Um, what, what they've done is tried out the first of their technologies uh, for, uh, you know, eliminating or, or, or netting space junk is the way to put it because that's exactly what it is. Uh, this is a net. Um, which can surround a piece of space junk and tether it basically to uh, a sort of parent spacecraft, which then itself re-enters and drags the space junk with it uh, to burn up harmlessly in the atmosphere. So we've seen now footage, there's um, uh, several websites where you can have a look at that. The, the footage that's come back from the University of Surrey showing the, the net being deployed. Um, and the net is really quite spectacular. Um, there's a lovely, image of the net uh, as it's stowed in its firing position that was uh, a, a, a obviously taken before the spacecraft was launched it just looks like a bowl of spaghetti mm. uh, but then it's very cleverly arranged a very cleverly designed net so that when it's fired outwards um, it, it it has sort of multiple lobes which um, which basically unfold around the piece of space junk that you've got there. And what they've done is they've taken up uh, one of these little nanocubes, these bread loaf sized um, spacecraft, and used that as the target. So they, they dumped that thing out, made it, made sure it was spinning because they, they nearly always are tumbling uh, end over end, these bits of space debris. And then they snared it with the, the net. Yeah. And it's worked and it, it's a very nice piece of work. Yeah, I've watched the video. It's sort of like uh, casting a net to catch fish It's a, or a spider web type of effect. Yeah. And, and yeah, it is. you can see the satellite spinning and the thing just wraps itself around the, 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 the space junk and, and completely bottles it up. It's really impressive. Very much so. So there's obviously some clever thinking going into the exact design of the net. And then in, in the, you know, in the real life scenario, uh, that 
uh, net will, as I said, be attached to a to a sort of mothership, which will be the thing that tows all these bits of space debris back down into the atmosphere and burns mm. them up. Yeah. How, how? What sort of speeds are we talking about in terms of this sort of capture? Um, in terms of the speed of the net around the, oh, do you mean the the, the orbiting speed? That yeah. The, yeah. So this is all happening at um, well. Uh, 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 about eight kilometers per second. 7.8 kilometers per second is the orbital speed at about 100, 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And it's not much less than that as you go higher. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, what, what I like about this is it highlights the problem and that there is an issue. And uh, it also highlights the need for uh, all new satellites um, to make sure that there is a way of bringing their satellite back down to Earth when its life has ended, uh, or any other anything else that fails in orbit. You want to have a mechanism that will let you get it down quickly so it doesn't become uh, an orbiting hazard. Uh, that is not yet part of the, the space rules and regulations, but there are hopes that it will be. It is for geostationary satellites. If you launch a geostationary satellite that's up much much higher than we're talking about here they're 36,000 kilometers high you have to have a way of putting your spacecraft into what's called a graveyard orbit one that will not and uh, you know endanger any other spacecraft uh, at the end of its life and that's been in place for quite some time or but the same is not true for lower ones or could you just slap on an extra engine you know just unused um, when it's finished its life fire it up uh, fire it up and, and send it off into oblivion yeah, that's uh, uh, yeah. Effectively, that's what you do. I mean, the problem is you never send it in oblivion because you're always in orbit around the Earth, unless you've got something that's capable of taking it beyond the escape velocity of the Earth. That that means big hardware. You know, yeah, that means big okay. rocket motors. Yeah. So I was dreaming a bit there. <laughs> um, get, uh, the, dream on because the next uh, stage in um, removed debris, and we we will no doubt talk about it. They've they've also got a harpoon. Um, which is very much like the old, you know, kind of whaling harpoons. Uh, the idea with this is that you you grab your your defunct spacecraft by s smashing into it with a harpoon. It's got uh, little uh, lobes on it that open up so that you can then drag the thing back uh, once again and uh, drag it back down uh, into the atmosphere to burn up. Mm. That is yet to be tested. We will await the results of that with great interest. They both sound quite feasible, and as this test proves, um, yeah, can work. Um, but I, I would imagine the removal of space junk is certainly a long-term prospect. Yeah, doing it one at a time certainly is. That's mm. right. So much of it. Yeah, and not cheap. Not cheap at all, I imagine. It's not. No. All right, well, we'll keep an eye on that, and uh, hopefully one day the skies will be clear. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, since we did the... <laughs> The episode, which was 100% dedicated to questions, we've received about 5,000 questions. <laughs> and uh, look, could be, That could be a slight exaggeration. I think it's only about 4,500. Yeah, it, it might be that. Anyway, we've reached the Lagrange point on questions. Uh, we're going to have to just leave them out there in, um, in no man's land for a while. Um, we will answer occasional ones, but we, I just don't think we're going to be able to get to absolutely each and every one. Uh, if we don't answer them in the podcast, we'll try and answer some of them on uh, our Facebook page or, or, or email back, whatever. Uh, but um, please don't be too disappointed if you don't hear from us because that's just the sort of people we are. No, uh, but we will answer a, qu a question now from Tim Gibbs, who's, uh, who's sent us a double bunger, and they're totally... I assume, unrelated. Hi, Fred and Andrew. I've been an avid listener since episode zero. I have some questions which I'd, uh, I, I think would make for interesting subjects for the podcast. You've, di dis uh, you've discussed the detection of gravity waves. I understand that we in Australia were offered one of these detectors at no cost to the electorate. Uh, what happened? Where is it? And I'll just read question two, which we'll get back to. Uh, many moons ago, I read a paper about how mass extinction events on Earth can be traced to the solar system's passage through the arms of the Milky Way. I've never been able to find uh, more information on this. 
What is the current thinking on this theory? Is there anything new? That is fascinating. We'll get back to that. But uh, yes, was Australia offered a gravity wave detector and did we take possession and did we use it or didn't we know how? Or what's the story, Fred? The, uh, as far as I know, um, we, we weren't offered a complete LIGO, uh, uh, which LIGO is the gravitational wave detector, which uh, exists in two places in uh, the United States. So there's two components to it. Um, however, we did have our own um, because uh, the University of Western Australia for many years had uh, Professor David Blair working there. Uh, he's now, I think, pretty well retired, although I'm sure he's still very enthusiastic about this. David set up the Gravitational Wave Group in uh, Uni University of, du of WA. They have quite a lot of equipment at a place called Jinjin, Jin, which is north of, uh, it's probably about 50, 60 kilometers north of Perth. Um, very interesting place. I've been there several times. Uh, the the technology that they evolved <clears throat> um, to try and build gravitational wave detectors, and this was probably back in the 80s and 90s, we now know was simply not sensitive enough to measure these gravitational waves. Uh, but what they did do uh, was um, specialize in some of the aspects that eventually found their way into LIGO. Um, so I think the bearings for the, for the masses, the gravitating masses, which are in there, the supports for them, which have to be very specially designed, and maybe even some of the optics because they have laser reflectors in LIGO. I'm not sure whether that was done in Australia as well. So uh, UWA have uh, played a very significant role in uh, the emergence of these gravitational wave detectors. And indeed, David Blair and several other of the people uh, uh, involved in UWA had their names on the on the first paper <coughs> for the first uh, gravitational wave detection from LIGO back in 2015, I guess it was now, the end of 2015. So um, there is a part to play. I am not aware of uh, Australia being offered one of the detectors. Uh, I will try and find out about that, but my suspicion is that <coughs> it was the other way around. We were offering to to help out, um, you know, to, to, to develop their detector technology, which in fact did happen. Mm, OK, so that answers the first question. The second question is even more intriguing. Many moons ago, I read about how mass extinction events on Earth can be traced to the solar system's passage through the arms of the Milky Way. I've never been able to find any more information about this. What is the current thinking of this theory? Is there anything new? Well, you're talking to the right bloke, Tim, because um, back in the 1980s, I worked with the people who basically proposed this idea. Uh, Victor Klub and Bill Napier, two of my colleagues at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, were very keen on the idea that the sun had interacted with things called giant molecular clouds in the spiral arms of the Milky Way as it makes its orbits around. The sun orbits once in about 200 million years around the centre of our galaxy. And so it does pass through regions of different density. Uh, it, it's not quite as, as clear as passing through spiral arms because everything's rotating. And, you know, the spiral arms, in a, in a sense, are, believe it or not, they're imaginary because they're the result of what we call density waves passing through the disk of the galaxy and causing young stars to be formed. But they, it's certainly true that the spiral arms are rich in these giant molecular clouds. And so the idea was that, yes, the sun and the whole solar system has periodically passed through these things. The, the mechanism is thought to be that the giant molecular cloud disturbs the Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud is this uh, spherical shell of comets that exists uh, around the sun at very great distances, way, way beyond the orbit of Neptune. Uh, and it's where comets come from, basically. So if you've got the Oort cloud being disturbed, then you pour many more comets into the inner solar system because the gravitational pull, um, they either, you know, get grabbed by Jupiter and go into short period uh, or they hit something um, and indeed we know comets hit things because we've seen it happen uh, with Comet Shoemaker-Levy back in the 1990s. Yes. Uh, so uh, that um, is, you know, it was postulated as one of the mechanisms for 
uh, for the, uh, the, the the extinction, or well, for the what you might call the cataclysmic events that the Earth has suffered from time to time. Victor and Bill went on to develop something called the theory of terrestrial catastrophism, uh, and they wrote a book called The Cosmic Serpent, which actually put out this idea of, of episodic disturbances of the Oort cloud and consequent mass extinctions. So the idea is still out there, but it's not, I have to say, it's not a particularly popular idea. Um, we don't have um, really that much evidence. You can look at these uh, mass extinction events and you can say, well, they are, they're not periodic. They don't sort of follow a, a you know, 200 million year periodicity or anything like that. But they do seem to be episodic, um, which means that they come and go. Uh, so maybe there is still something in it. That theory is definitely real. It's not something you imagine, Tim. Uh, it's out and about, but it's not seen, as I said, uh, really as being one of the principal mechanisms that has, has shaped the Earth. It's thought that uh, this sort of thing has been going on all the time at a, a low level. And maybe there are peaks in it when you get the, one of these disturbances. Mm. I think and more work, more work will be done on it. More work needs to be done. If my colleague Victor Klub was sitting next to me now, and he's not because he lives in Bayeux in France, uh, he, and he's now retired, he would be telling me uh, I'm talking rubbish, and this is exactly how these things happen because of <laughs> in the clouds. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, from a layman's perspective, if the Oort cloud is disturbed and uh, disturbed and, and comets are released, there's no absolute guarantee they're going to come near us anyway so that, that's right yeah but you if know. you've got enough of them there's a good chance that you know things will happen yes i suppose so um and um, when when do we pass through one of these arms again <laughs> Fred? well you better put this in your diary probably uh, i would say in about 150 million years maybe something like that all right so I'll, I'll sit we're right. actually in one now andrew we're, we're in a, a oh. on the edge of something called the orion spur of one of the spiral arms so that might be you know, that might have been our passage through that that caused the death of the dinosaurs or something like that. We don't know. Okay, wow. So these things stretch out a bit. They last yes, a long they, time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, fascinating. Uh, Tim, hopefully we've uh, we've covered your two questions and thank you for sending them in. Very insightful and very interesting indeed. Uh, thank you, Fred, as always. Lots of fun. Good to talk to you. Andrew, as always, a great pleasure, and I look forward to the next time. I'm sure we'll find something to talk about again. I imagine so. Probably questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll do the questions as well. Yes, OK. Uh, Fred Watson, uh, astronomer, joins us every week here on Space Nuts, and it is certainly good to have you uh, tuning in every week in whatever form you choose to download us, and we, uh, we do love the feedback as well, even comments and observations uh, that we get on Facebook and Twitter. It's, uh, it's terrific. And we also look forward to chatting to you again next time on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audioboom and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.